Welcome to Human Potential at Work, the show where we explore social impact, inclusion, and empowerment of everyone, including persons with disabilities. Get ready to be inspired, Have hear success book. stories, and learn <laughs> tips and principles for bringing out the best in everyone. Hello, everyone. This is Deborah Rue, and this is Human Potential at Work. Uh, I am the CEO of Rue Global, and we are strategists and market influencers for the community of people with disabilities and the aging market. Today, my guest is, um, is talking about a topic that's very uh, near and dear to my heart and probably all of your hearts too, because this is a, um, it's a pretty staggering problem that is happening in our societies all over the world, and we have not figured out what to do about it. So luckily, we have... Nicole Amesbury, and she's a licensed therapist in private practice speaker and an expert in cyber psychology. I never heard of cyber psychology, Nicole, but welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure. And I just want to say hello to everyone who's tuning in and uh, wanting to know more. Yes, and I, we, we'd already started some conversations before we went on air because it's a very important and, and very interesting topic, I think. So, um, Tell us about you first. Tell us, you know, how a little bit more about your career and what you've done and um, how you got engaged with uh, cyber psychology and ensuring we're having healthy, um, we're having good, healthy mental health when it comes to our digital. And the digital, that's such a big word. It's such mm. a big word. It, it encompasses so many things. So tell us more about your work and yourself. Yes, thank you. Um, so I'm First and foremost, uh, a psychotherapist, and I see patients individually for psychotherapy as near and dear to my heart. <laughs> I love helping people uh, in, in you know, the talk, the, the therapeutic hour. And uh, so this led me, of course, you know, starting out as a new therapist uh, over eight years ago um, and working in the community where I, where I live in Florida, there are so many problems with people getting access to mental health care. And, and falling out of the system. And uh, that's when I got connected with a startup, which is I think where the part of technology comes in, um, who was trying to do something innovative by helping people with online therapy. And uh, so I joined them because it was an amazing mission uh, so that people wouldn't fall out of care and became the head of clinical development. And that company has grown and, and been very successful. Many people I'm sure have probably heard of it. And, uh, and then in February this year, uh, after being there for uh, seven years, I, I decided that um, I would focus more on, continue to focus on my private practice, but also focus on consulting with companies and working with um, larger corporations about technology and the effects it's having on mental health and social media <clears throat> and the problems people have that play out and, and concerns, and that's been very rewarding. And so this is going to continue. And it, it, I think, you know, um, it's a problem we're just beginning to really talk about and address, and it needs a lot more attention. I agree. And this is a topic that I've talked about um, on air before with my uh, producer, Doug Foresta. And, uh, uh, and Doug, and even, uh, Doug and I started writing a book on this. And then Doug's like, oh, Deborah, we got to bring Nicole into it. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping that we might even do something together because the mental health, you know, making sure that we stay mentally healthy is is critical all the time, but we're seeing a lot of people have major problems with mental health. We're seeing it all over the place. We're seeing, you know, the shootings in the American schools. I mean, there's so many things. People are depressed. They're, uh, it, it's, it's, you can feel the energy of people just being overwhelmed. And there are, I love technology. I love social media. There's so much I, I really love about uh, the ability to get on this program right now, speak to you in Florida. I'm in Virginia. We have um, our transcriber, our captioner on here. I'm Dawn. I'm not sure where she's from. Doug is in Massachusetts. And, and then we have um, an audience in over 84 countries. So we couldn't do that without technology. But at the same time, I go into restaurants and we'll see a family. And I'll, I'll be honest. I've been guilty of this myself before, but we'll see a family of four people and everybody's on their different devices and nobody's really talking to each other even after the meal arrives. And that's just a small example. Well, I just drove home yesterday from, from New York. The drivers are 
so distracted. They're so, and you can tell who's texting. It's very obvious. Your little quick text, we know, because you just swerved into my lane. So, mm -hmm. and 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 then on top of it, things like I remember my my children are older now, but I remember. Um, the issues they were dealing with were very different from the issues I dealt with when I was a teenager. I remember um, one of my son's friends that lived with us for a couple of years, she was getting into online fights with her girlfriends and the things they were saying to each other were shocking. And, um, and then others were joining on. So there's cyber bullying. There's, there's a lot about this. There's a lot. And one thing I would be wondering, Nicole, are you seeing um, are you seeing a drop in mental health or, you know, it's getting unhealthier because of not really knowing how to control all of the technology coming at us? Do you, are you seeing it, it really affect your patients? Well, yes. I mean, I think all I think parents so. are. I mean, it, you know, times have changed and you used to sit down and talk to someone in person for an hour. And, and, and now it's, you know, like you said, technology is wonderful and we can reach mm -hmm. people and, and people can come online for therapy would never ever otherwise be able to access care. But then you have other things like them sharing screenshots with you or in your office saying, I've got to read you this conversation I had with the quarrel mm -hmm. with my partner verbatim, <laughs> you know? And so- wow. I didn't think about that. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, and so it's just infused in every part of, of our uh, existence at this point, and, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that we, there are so many devices, right. and, and they're so mobile, and so having your smartphone on you all the time, and I think we all know that, that feeling of losing a limb, if you lose, you know, that panic if you leave your smartphone, right? And, yeah. and now, it's, it, of course, now the next uh, level of that is the watch on you all the time yeah <laughs> yeah so i mean there's this constant uh tracking constant monitoring constant checking and, and it's it it is not necessarily healthy and a lot of people That's are what i would think right and, yeah. and also we don't even know what this is doing to us all the time being around besides the mental health yeah you know what does like I have to take my daughter's phone away from her at night. And I always say, science says, as every night she fights with me about it, but it's like, we're not sleeping in the same room with our devices. We're, we put them in the bathroom and we're going to go to sleep. And, we're, and I actually, I've had some real behavior issues with my daughter. And I, as we were researching these topics, uh, I, I, I had read that the teenagers, preteens and early teens, um, as their brains are still, you know, maturing, um, that they're more susceptible. They're more susceptible to getting addicted to these devices and using addicted in a way, not like you do, we do it, you know, carelessly, like, oh, you're so addicted, but true addiction that is actually changing the personality. And you know, changing the way that you interact with the world or you don't interact with the world. And I'll tell you, Nicole, sometimes um, I'm a baby boomer and I'm really trying to encourage the other baby boomers, the other people my age to really awaken again and give back and start really making a difference with the other generations because we were always advocates early on in our lives. And then we, you know, started, you know, raising families and everything. But now that we're 54 years old or older, I think it's time for the baby boomers to really reawaken and get back in and start helping everybody. And, but I see the addiction to all this technology and I, you know, you see the, we saw it with the video games, it, at least that's where I first started seeing it. And then it has morphed into something that I don't even how you know how you deal with it as, you know, a medical professional, well, a mental I health professional. You're making many great points. And I think something you said that really uh, strikes a chord is that, you, you know, when talking about baby boomers, we have two types of people who are using this technology. We have the technology uh, immigrants, which are older people who, you know, for example, I grew up uh, in, in the early days that a phone had a cord. You could not walk further than six <laughs> without- So you got a long cord. <laughs> so, yeah, right? And then the, the, the cordless phone came out and that was a huge deal. But, but there's that generation of, you know, you know of, native, of immigrants and then there's uh, technology natives who grew up in their whole lives. 
they've had in the classroom at right. home, everywhere they go, there is technology. And in some ways, surprisingly, they know how to cope with it better. Right. Uh, but, but because they've, it's just very natural to them. But I think that divide uh, and the shift between the, the ages is something that very much needs to be addressed so that, that people can understand each other. And, and it affects groups differently because of ages. And, and that's important. Um, but but it's, a, it's something that is really changing our relationships and our family relationships and our closest bonds. It, it's affecting it in a way that needs to be addressed. And it, you know, just, just like we said before, there's some good things. And I, I think mm -hmm. the overall message is, is that we need to learn how to use technology and not let technology use us. And that is, that's really the main point because all of it can be good, but it needs to be in its place. And when you talked about personality and it changing our personality, I think for teens emerging and their, their personalities uh, not completely fixed and still developing, there is a very rich world that they experience online. And some people could say addiction, but I think people need to understand that their social lives are on technology. It's a part of their social lives. If we were to try to take it away from them, they would not have a social life in the same way. They'd be ostracized right. for years. And so it is a, it is something that that isn't going away and, we, and we're going to need to, to learn how to manage it. Uh, but then there are very practical points too. For example, sleep. Uh, the greatest things that impacts people's mental health is inability to get good sleep. And we know that from the blue screens and the lighting on technology, it interferes with your melatonin levels and your quality of sleep. And, and we sleep with alarms on our, our smartphones and everything else. And, and Ethan so, and Whirlin and... Yeah, so it's a really important thing to, to at least an hour before someone is going to turn into to sleep uh, that they you know, set the mood. <laughs> they wind down, they turn off the screens, turn their lighting down and, and really begin to relax and, and, and be grounded in their environment. Uh, otherwise it interferes. And I think for teens in particular, really important that they get good sleep as their brains are developing. Right. And, <laughs> and my daughter, my daughter, <clears throat> she's 31 years old and she was born with Down syndrome. And she is a very smart, very smart um, woman. And, but I would um, judge her, uh, her development at around uh, a preteen. Uh, she, uh, she'll make decisions like this. And I say this very lovingly because she's a wonderful young woman, but she, she is now ready, so ready to move out. And so she's going to get an apartment. And somebody said, well, how are you going to, you know, you have to learn to cook and um, she said, no, I don't. They said, well, what are you going to do about food? She said, well, I'll just go um, to IHOP. Shout out to IHOP. <laughs> I'll go to IHOP every day. And so they said, uh, okay, well, how are you going to pay for that? And she's like, I have a credit card. It's like, okay. Mm -hmm. And how are you going? And so she can't, she has never connected those dots and that's okay. And, um, but she, she's, she makes decisions based on this technology and she she multitasks on her technology she will be using um, she'll be watching a video she'll be listening to um, a soundtrack on her stereo and she'll be playing games and interactive games on her iPhone and she's really strong on technology but if I let her do it too long and I try to always be supervising her which she doesn't appreciate but if I let her do it too long the mood gets very dark and and, and it gets really frightening and we've actually had some tussling. And I, so I'd, I'd see that. So what I tried, I've tried so many things, but one thing I tried was I thought, okay, well, I'm gonna, um, you, uh, I use an app called Our Pact, P-A-C-T. There's a lot of them out there. I just like this one. And we've actually talked about it on the show before. We've had them on the show, but I thought, well, I'm gonna shut down all of our apps so that, um, I'm not physically having to take the phone away. And for uh, from six o'clock until eight o'clock, I'm gonna, uh, it's family time. And then she can use the phone from say eight until 10. 
Well, as you just said, Nicole, that didn't work very well at all because she actually got wound up and kept saying, can I have a little more? Can I have a little more time? And so I finally figured out by my big self that I need to do the opposite. So we take breaks, but at eight o'clock or 730, we're done with technology. And I honor her and then I also put away all of my, my technology and my husband puts away his because I don't think it's fair to say you have to do it and then we don't follow through. Yeah. But she's yeah. sleeping better now. The moods are better. She feels healthier. I think she's stronger. It's it's a real touch your way, feel your way around as you go. <laughs> and I think that's a real challenge for any parent. Well, not just the nagging because we've all experienced that, you know, of like, can I have a little more? Can I have a little more? And then the aggression if you try to, if you try to take it. Yes. Yeah, and, and it, it can get very um, violent. There have been some very violent episodes. Uh, but but I think another point you're making is is this point that, you know, if you're telling uh, your kids or, or, or even your partner or anyone, you know, I, you need to get off the technology. But then the second a ping happens, it's I'm picking up my phone and looking, then it's this constant distraction and feeling like we're slaves to technology that, that and, and then not able to, everyone make a, a pack together, like a concerted, a, a concerted um, promise to each other and, and follow through with it that, okay, that this has to go away now. And, and what's so important that impacts mental health on that is, is, is the human bonding and the sharing and the good times and the connection and attachment that people need to have that are healthy with each other. And, and that cannot be completely replaced with technology. I mean, technology does connect us to other people in mm -hmm. some very beautiful ways, uh, some very touching ways. Um, but at some point we need human skin to skin contact, we need hugs, we need eye contact, we need all, you know, a full scope of it. And so we can't, technology can't have more of a weight over our lives right. than real life contact with people. And I think that's one of the, the most uh, concerning things that I see as a therapist in my practice is that people who are already somewhat isolated, right. but more and more isolated over time. And technology is a major contributor to that because I don't have to even go to IHOP. <laughs> I could order some food on my phone and never have to see someone. I mean, we have uh, teens suffering from, or anyone really suffering from social anxiety that won't call for a pizza because they don't want to be on the phone. They want to order it online because they're so anxious. And so it's a, it, it enables them to, to grow their social anxiety and not be able to, to move towards healing. And, and that's, it's very important that we recognize that for a population of people, uh, technology is really hurting them. Right. Really, really interfering with their mental health. And I think the, a, a big example of that is the, um, it, one of the contributing factors to some of the mass shootings we've seen. Right, right. Yes, uh, and and uh, and taking this now and broadening it a little bit more, then you go to the social media aspects, and I, I can't help but think of a good example of um, a recent presidential election in the United States that happened. Uh, I could tell you almost the exact days, but uh, a few years ago, and families were taking not only to social media to divide. There were people that were saying, I believe this. And if you don't believe what I believe about this, don't even friend. I'm not even your friend anymore. And they were, and that kind of behavior was going on. And, and it, as we knew at the time that was, you know, we vote in November, Thanksgivings were very hard for families that year. Families were very divided. They, so the technology actually caused part of that division, not all of it, but it really it contributed to that division. And I think it seems, I don't know if I'm just optimistic, it seems like it's a little bit better though. People seem to be, I'm on social media a lot because of my work, but people seem to be being nicer to each other, or maybe it's just where I'm playing on social media because I believe that it's, you know, really important to um, I think there kind. is somewhat of an increased awareness uh, in some in some places, but 
you know, what you're saying is about, at least in my playing field, because it's really important people understand a couple of things. <laughs> what, you, what you see on your screen is not what the other person at the end of the screen, what they see on their screen is completely different. The advertisements that they're fed, the other people around them that they surround themselves with, it is a completely different experience for them. And, and, and we, it, it's very linear looking at this screen and seeing, scrolling and seeing things. And what we forget, what, what slips to the back of our mind is the real person, the real human being on the other end that's receiving all of the information, that's, a, that's reading our text, that, there's, it, that, that there is a real person. It's people, it, it's, it creates a, a kind of a split where people kind of don't can put, put the person kind of off to the side and they can be more aggressive and they can say things they would never say to someone if they were in person with them. And, and that creates a lot of conflict and there, there needs to be a lot of education about that. That, that, that you know, you, re you really have the ability, we all have the ability to, if we go online, uh, to, to touch someone in some way. It's a different type of touch, but we're touching them. You know, we're, we're, we're what we're putting out there, uh, we're putting out there and someone's, someone's taking it in. Someone's really taking it in. And it's, it's like, I, I don't know, I'm kind of focusing on this, but it's hard, hard for people for, to really sink in because when they put posts on social media, they don't think about every single person that's going to, that's going to reach. Oftentimes, maybe even they think of one person it's going to reach or, or they just think about how many likes they're going to get or what impact it's going to have to fuel their ego and, and make them feel better. They don't think about how, how it's a, it really is a social community. It's a social group. And, and uh, I was saying this the other day to someone, a lot of the things people will say on social media, they would never, like if they had to get up on a stage in front of an audience of 200 people, Right. They will not say what they're saying, but they will post it to 500 people very easily. But if you were to say to that same person, walk up on the stage and say this, no way. <laughs> and so, I, you know, I think people have some grasp and perspective o over the power of their words and what they're communicating and um, for all of us to have that. And so that we can be pro-social and not have some of the social problems that are playing out. And, and for teens in particular, for, for emerging adults, one of the developmental tasks that, that a lot of kids have is that they try on different personas. So, you know, one, one day they're the rebel and they, you know, with torn yes. and all this, and then the next day there's something else. And social media and, and the anonymity of the internet allows um, people to try on these different behaviors and personas and to adopt a persona that's that's and try it out and what some people do is they have a lot of people i think this will resonate with everyone they have an online persona and then they have an in real life persona wow. and this is what this is the real kind of uh i, I, I was a crucible of the uh, of the problem with, that we're seeing with personality because we talk about virtual reality. Right. Virtual reality is not real reality. If you think about the definition of psychosis, psychosis is a separation of reality. Huh. So we're all in psychosis, darn it. <laughs> a <laughs> so little we're bit. A lot of us are a little bit psychotic, but, but I think <laughs> the thing about that, that that really is powerful is that and when I go back to school shootings and, and a lot of the things we've heard about um, some of the some of the people that uh, that, that have committed uh, uh, these acts and then and then unfortunately killed themselves too is right. that a lot of these a lot of these are young males they've been on a psychotropic medication before for psychosis or they've had problems with psychosis and they have very <clears throat> rich lives online and even um, even the older gentlemen uh, that did the shooting in Nevada did a lot of gaming and gambling online and when when you get so wrapped up into that different world and you already have uh, a, a susceptibility to psychosis it's very dangerous yes it is so dangerous and dangerous in ways that 
it sometimes feels that we can't predict a society. And it seems like, you know, certain parts of our society, um, you know, are, are more susceptible to this, but it is impacting everybody. And it's, uh, it's fascinating to watch people go online and, and you wonder sometimes, you can almost get paranoid because you wonder, I'll just give you an example. The other day on Twitter, somebody mirrored my account. They, uh, they took my, my photo, they took my bio, they started tweeting the same tweets. And they had, my, my ID is Deborah Rue, D-E-B-R-A-R-U-H. So they said Deborah Rue, but the last character was underscore. So they totally copied my account. And so we, I, several of us noticed, you know, some of my good friends and noticed something was going on. And I noticed that I reported to Twitter, boom, Twitter took them down right away. But you started thinking, well, what were you going to do with that account? And, and also, I think when you say, I'm going to post something online and a person is going to read it, well, now we, some of us are paranoid or say, is a person reading it? Or, of course, people are reading it, but what about the bots? Are the bots doing it? And, it, and so there's, and, and of course, you see Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, they're all trying to deal with this, but it's so big. And it does remind me of the gaming because if you're out there and I have friends, I have a friend of mine right now that she is always online and gaming and she in real, she's very depressed. She doesn't like to go outside. She doesn't want to work. And so all she does is play these avatars and she's a powerful warrior princess. And, but she, so I, 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 you know, and, and we know what can go wrong with this, but, but it seems like people are getting more and more isolated. And we sometimes think of the new technology happening, the IOTs, the, the artificial intelligence and things that there is somehow technology is going to come and rescue us when ex, actually, if we're not careful, technology isolates us more. And I, I think it's interesting what you're being about, saying about psychosis, because I didn't think about that perspective. Yeah. Uh, and um you know, that's the paradox of technology is that we go on because we want to have a wonderful experience. And I think, you know, I've had some great, some amazing experiences online, uh, helping people in therapy. And, and I think, you know, a lot of us have, have seen an inspiring two minute video or read something and got a little tear in our eye and felt warm, you know, or, you know, we've had moments of, uh, you know, maybe we post our, our kids graduation from uh, school and everybody's connected and, and it's great to share that way uh, but that isn't that, that that isn't the full experience unfortunately and the paradox is is that the social groups are so large and then uh, these companies that started out you know Facebook Twitter uh, Instagram all the social media then uh, they're businesses and they have to monetize and they you know they, they want to make money and so advertisers come on and so I think we know from uh, from this uh, last presidential election and from some of the recent articles that have came out about um, Google and banking and, and, you know, marketing people selling information, companies selling information or, or, or people using it for targeted advertising, uh, that, that seems very frightening. Who, who's, who's taking my information? And I mean, they're having hearings on it right now in, in Washington, D.C. Who's taking my information and what are they doing with it? Right. And, and, and they've got everything they've got. And how many times do you hear somebody comes in the public life all of a sudden and it's like, did you see those racist tweets that they tweeted uh, 15 years ago? Did you see, I remember um, a long time ago, my son was dating a girl and we were connected on Facebook and I, uh, I brought up Facebook one day and she was um, dressed in an attire that I would have suggested she not go on Facebook with. And she was using um, a, this huge bong and it comes through my feed. And I was like, oh, what are you doing? You're about to graduate from high school. I, what are you doing in so many ways? But you're also about to go to college and the colleges are looking on and that was years ago, but, but I think sometimes the teens and other, you know, people like my daughter with intellectual disabilities, they don't understand how permanent that post is. Because even 
if you delete that post, so she deletes that post, I could have already saved it or did something else. And it doesn't matter that you deleted it. I got it now. And I how am I using it? Right. And, and, and so protecting ourselves, protecting us, um, our, the girls, you know, us as women and, and children. And um, it, it used to be, don't, if somebody offers you candy, Deborah, on the street in a white van, do not accept it. I mean, there were, I had rules. You have to be in before dark. Yeah. You, you know, but now. Yeah. And, don't accept, don't talk to strangers, but now it's gone to go on, go on a dating app, talk to a complete stranger. And in a very short period of time, not knowing if it's a, 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 a fake account, go and meet them somewhere and get into, right. a, into an Uber with them. So, yes. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and I, we don't. Don't under, in some ways, crime has gone down because of the smartphone, because people can be caught very easily. Right. But, but I think we also need to recognize our vulnerability. I mean, human trafficking has had great right. by being able to reach out to people this way. And, and so uh, it's important to be able to understand that everything that you see, you know, all the communication you're having online, if you don't know that person in real life, uh, if you haven't met them, um, they may not be presenting themselves a hundred percent. Maybe they are 50%, but they're not present. Maybe, maybe they're, you know, not really uh, who they are. And, and uh, you know, I, people want, people want to feel accepted. They want to feel belonging. They want to feel, yes. and social, social media, that is, that has been the, the manna, <laughs> if you will, that people look for on social media is, you know, people like me, people are my friends. Right, right. And, and I just, you know, just say to that, especially people have like, all these people on their accounts they don't really know. You know, there's an old um, African saying, not by every lion uh, that licks you, uh, likes you. Some of them want to eat you. <laughs> 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 and, and, and some of you are predators online. And, and there are people yes. also that just don't, you know, they have, they're not, tuned in to they're not in your world they're in a whole different environment with a whole different screen and and they may not care about you so much no they don't. they're cared about how many likes they get <clears throat> so i know we're nearing the end of our time but <clears throat> excuse me what i'd like you to talk about nicole it's two a couple things and and i know these are big things so i will definitely invite Nicole to come back on the program. And one thing we definitely, we want you to know, she has some online courses you can visit. We'll make sure you have information to get to Nicole. And um, I'm hoping once again, Nicole, Doug and I can, you know, work on this book together. But I think one thing, it, it's so scary knowing what to do to protect our loved ones. And I told this really, really sad story on air one time before of, I don't know this family. I accidentally heard this story from somebody else, but they um, had a beautiful 16 year old daughter. She was doing real well in school. A couple of years before they gave her a phone um, and the, you know, the police showed up at their door and she had been taking photographs on her phone of parts of her body she shouldn't be sharing and uploading them and being paid on a site. And so she was actually arrested for child pornography for it being involved in child pornography, the parents were floored. They had absolutely no idea that this was happening. And I think part of the problem is, is all of us, you don't know where your loved ones are going on these social media and on these technologies. You don't know where they are and how they're exposing themselves. And so what can we do, Nicole? I mean, once again, Sarah's a 31 year old woman with Down syndrome. And, I want to protect her without smothering her, with giving her her choices. And there's, what do we do to try to protect our loved ones? I think, and ourselves the, maybe, right, yeah, Nicole? Ourselves yeah. too. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing is, you know, it, we talk about addiction, and, and we, we know in the area of addiction that just, you know people are often able to point out someone else's problems with it, but to, to accept that we have, may have a little problem ourselves, you know. <laughs> One thing, um, but but I think the the error or, or you know kind of the the thing that I see a lot of parents do, and and you know I know it's a challenge. I and it's and because technology is so new and fast, I 
and I've experienced so, so many of these moments myself, I, I don't want anyone to feel guilty or about how they're parenting or anything like that because it's, it's, it's a problem we're all trying to tackle. Uh, but I think that the thing that's important not to do is to try to be controlling and, and, and micromanage your kids. I mean, a lot of parents have tracking devices. A lot of parents have all of these things and, and kids are very smart. They could easily uh, dismantle these. You know, you pay, you pay for the software and then your kid hack, you know, finds a workaround every time and it becomes like a, a arms race, you know? That's my daughter, that's my daughter, yeah. absolutely. And you know, with couples who are, are having fidelity problems too, you know, like this, this game that plays out online of, oh, I can track you this way. Oh yeah, well I can, you know, it's like cat and mouse. <laughs> that, that is just gonna lead to a power struggle. I think, I think what's important is to make the offline world very alluring. Yes, <laughs> yes. You're yelling at your kid, get off the phone, get off the phone now because you have to take out the trash and do the homework, <laughs> you know, and that's not going to make anybody feel inspired. But I think, you know, if you, if you think about why they're really there, what are they getting out of it? Is it, is it a positive social experience? Is it playing a game? Because you could play a game, you could play Monopoly. <laughs> it's not gonna be a game. I don't wanna, you know, that's like telling a kid apple when they want a <laughs> candy. But I, I think that it is important to realize that you want, you want to, to catch them in times that, that they're offline and having fun, increase that, uh, in, increase the pleasurable and, and good experiences offline and make the communication you have with people offline very quality. And, and uh, you know, just kind of extinguish what isn't working that way, you, you know? And so, you know, I, if you say, well, to, to your kid, well, I miss you. I want to see your face more. I want to talk to you. Uh, a, a thing that a lot of families do that is very effective is make an agreement to have a family dinner at the table and put down all the devices and yep. we are going to have family dinner. And there's research that shows that this solves a lot of problems, just not with the use of technology, but with you know, kids being more open and sharing. And, uh, and then I think when you know, we talk about these things where you know, people are sharing all kinds of things, photos and sexting and everything like that, um, I, I think that when someone gets, when someone gets discovered doing something like that, you know, they, people believe the, uh, the technology, like this anonymity behind the screen and the privacy, they believe they're doing these things in secret. And those, right. secrets, those secrets could be revealed even very quickly. We even see this in our government. Like things you're doing <laughs> could be revealed very easily. Right, very easily. right, right. And so, you know, shaming someone for that is oftentimes makes them go more and more underground. But talking with them and, ha and having an open discussion about it without shaming them and, and just trying to figure out, it, you know, what the mechanics of it were. Of course, getting help with a the therapist. Right, right. And also, Nicole, that, that terrible example I gave of that young woman <clears throat> and her family. So we can decide she's a bad girl and her parents are terrible. Or I would, and I didn't go there at all. I thought, I felt like the girl was a victim and so are her parents because there's this, there's this incestuous, there's this really horrible business that's making a lot of money. And there's these pervert. And so there's this whole industry behind it. This young lady, this 16 year old, she didn't have a chance. I mean, because they're predators in a way that, how in the world are we supposed to address this? And so I think really, and, and our children, are, we all know when you're paying attention to me or when you're not, even if I'm standing there listening to you, Nicole, but I'm thinking of all my to-do items I have to do, we know it. And we found that we did, that's what we did as a family. We um, have dinner with nothing on, but, but, but we have engaging conversations. And then we actually did take to the games the apple to apple, there's a new game we got uh, once upon a time that somebody had recommended, uh, Michael had recommended to us. And some of these games, we can't as a family play these games the way the game designers created because 
we have some disabilities in our families. And so what we do is we get real creative with how we play these games. And we have so much fun together that we all look forward to it now. And it's a simple thing because it's what people used to do a long time ago, but it's been, it's really helped our family get a lot healthier. Yeah. I, I think that we can find these, like, and just like people could find workarounds and uh, to go deeper under, underground and do, do these things. We can find, we can find equal uh, solutions just by using our imagination a little bit and just by thinking, well, what, what is it that we want to see happen? You know, a lot of times we're trying to stop an activity. It's like, like I've got to get <clears throat> this, I've got to stop it. And, and a lot of times it's not about stopping something, it's about creating something new right. and you know, a new experience uh, because it, it's very difficult to go back and say, I want to stop this and go back to the old way. We're not going back to the old way. <laughs> We're not going back. We're not so going back. We have to create a new way together. And, and so I think that's where you have a lot of resistance. And, but there's, I mean, there's wonderful. I, I, I want people to feel hope with this because people right. are, seeing, I see more and more conversations, more and more companies are hiring me for their employees and for also the development of, uh, of the technology they use uh, and, and really can concerned with, okay, we want to create a quality experience um, and, and not just a quality experience that makes us more money, um, but, but people seem to be getting that there is an ethical responsibility associated to this. And that, and that if you make the fast and easy money, uh, you know, just doing the marketing and clicks and everything, it's, it's not necessarily going to be a long-term business solution. So some of these people are, are actually realizing, you know, this people people have suffer in real life and they have conflicts and mental health problems because we're making them click all the time. It's not a long sustaining, you know, to have a long-term business and grow, you know, your consumers. It, 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 it benefits all companies to be forward thinking about this and mental health. It, it really does. So they could create a win-win scenario. <clears throat> and it's not going away. I remember uh, Doug's, uh, Eleanor, his little, his little girl, and, and she's older now, but when she was four months old, she took his phone and she was looking at it and all of a sudden she was pinching the picture and Doug's like, oh my God, when did she learn that she, bo she was born knowing how to use an iPhone? Uh, and it's, so this isn't going away, but we have to learn to really be mindful, really be present and really really be engaged in each other's lives to make sure we protect each other. It's, it's very interesting, but I could talk to you for days and days and days, Nicole, but tell, tell the audience, because a lot of corporations, a lot of people in corporations do watch the show, but tell, tell everyone how they can learn more about your work, you know, uh, follow you, you know, well, I, you know, I'm no stranger either. I'm, <laughs> I'm on social media, on Twitter, on Instagram, <laughs> Facebook, um, and, and people could reach me at my email, which is psychotherapydna at gmail.com and, and reach out to me. Um, you know, I still maintain a private practice seeing patients and that, because that's, and that gives me, um, that lends a great deal. And I, I hope people know who seek therapy when they come in, they're doing everyone else a service too, because when a therapist sees them, it expands our whole knowledge base greater too. And I would have never heard about these technology problems in the same way, except for brave, courageous people coming in to talk about them and how these situations are playing out in their lives and the concerns they're having without it. And I think one of the important things I discovered is that people aren't just on the internet uh, having problems like simple addiction problems because of clicking their relationship their social relationships are online and, and the stories that I hear are, are um, rich and deep and important and and so uh, you know I think people could continue uh, I, I think seeking therapy if if you need it is very important and very helpful very, very helpful and very effective so yeah, people could buy, find me on social media. Uh, I have a, a website that's going to be launching soon too, uh, just in the in the workings of it right now. Um, to update that. And we'll we'll add that online when you have it. But <clears throat> I also want to say, it's very important sometimes to talk to a mental health professional, and I know I have many times in my life. But take the time to find the right mental health professional because I know when we first started having some behavior issues with our 
daughter, there were some really bad things happening in our life. My mom was dying. There was some real bad, stressful things happening in our life. Sarah's father was getting sick. To a therapist. And I told the therapist before I met with her that she had Down syndrome. And, you know, I was very open about what the problem was. And so we get there to the therapy session and she starts with a disclaimer, um, which of course everybody would do, you know, if, if you're hurting someone else or hurting yourself, you know, we have to, uh, you know, obligation to tell the place, blah, blah, blah. She gave that disclaimer. So my daughter, who's very smart and very creative without missing a beat starts saying, so she's like, if you're hurting somebody or somebody's hurting you. And my daughter's like, well, my ex-husband is hitting me and this, and he kicked me when I was, she goes in this elaborate tell and she's a good storyteller. And the therapist was just shocked. And then I let her go on for a couple minutes and I stopped and I said, okay, that's why we're here. We're having these elaborate stories. And the therapist said, oh, I can't help you. And she just ended the session, charged us. And it was very discouraging for my husband and I. We thought, oh, it's because my daughter has Down syndrome. She doesn't get access to mental health support. I'm confused. And unfortunately, that happens a lot for people with disabilities. That's a whole nother show. But I really think it's good to take the time to find the therapist that works best with you. And obviously, Nicole would be a wonderful choice. But and, and I think don't let an experience of, of, of one unqualified or you know, untrained therapist that didn't act well, um, no. you know, deter you. And, and I do know that happens to people, unfortunately, things like that. Uh, but but there are, you know, other people who can help and, and will help. So it's important to check, you know, obviously the licensing information, but also, you know, have a little chat interview beforehand and, and ask, ask, you know, the important questions um, about how you're going to get care and what it's going to be like. Right. And if it's not working, find somebody else. So anyway, mm -hmm. Nicole, thank you for your work. We need you so bad. We, the world needs the Nicoles of the world to, um, keep us healthy with our technology and we all need to engage with each other. So um, special thanks to our captioner, Dawn, for helping us today. She's with Archive Captioning. Always thanks to Doug Foresta, um, our producer, and Nicole, I'm hoping you'll come back on the program again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's been great. Yeah. Bye.